Right, so welcome everybody to another edition of the Influencer Marketing Roundtable. Um, for those of you that don't know who I am, um, I am a podcaster. I host the Influence Global Podcast, which any of you want to listen to, you can do so on Spotify or on many other, any other of the Apple and uh, uh, online networks. Um, I'm also an author of Influencer Marketing Strategy, uh, which has done very well, and um, soon to be published in Brazil, which I'm really excited about. Uh, I also write a weekly column for the London Evening Standard. Uh, and I speak at events, both in terms of a panelist, uh, a keynote speaker, and an, an MC. But as uh, Jimbo, who's on the call with us uh, today, um, I'm also the uh, Chief Strategy Officer for Audience to Media, which is a global influencer marketing agency. But also involved in the association sector as well. I'm the founder of Influence, which is the division of the Branded Content Marketing Association, founder of Membership World, which is a community of trade associations and professional membership bodies, and also the co-founder of the MESA, which is the Meetings and Event Support Association. Um, but I also help individuals and companies really leverage their own influence. And I do that through my online program, um, which I take outside of business hours. But it's a really, really great vehicle uh, to enable people to become more influential. Why? Because they want to charge higher prices, they want more customers coming to them, and they want their content consumed by a wider audience. And I go through a five-step process um, that actually does deliver those results. The feedback I've had from some of the clients I've been working with has been quite astounding. And uh, two of them will want to continue with me uh, after the program, which is really, really good. So if anybody's interested in that, then certainly uh, drop a line to me, gordon at gordonglancer.com, or indeed if you know anybody else that's interested, then that would be good as well. Um, we're going to be talking today about influencer marketing case studies. Um, I am going to get Jimbo to do his bit in a few minutes, but I've just brought a few together that are uh, on the internet, which I thought might be interesting. Um, so Warber Parker is a glasses brand and they selected seven micro influencers uh, with a re relatively decent following on, on Instagram and YouTube. And what they really wanted to do is get real lifestyle, lifestyle pictures of people wearing uh, their brand. And um, you'll notice, of course, that it's only seven. And sometimes people think, my goodness, we need a lot of influencers to get a lot of eyeballs. Um, it all depends on the engagement rate of those individuals. Some you may have heard us many times talk about the um, the the importance of of having a good engagement rate when you're selecting influencers. Um, at Audience to Media, for example, we look at a minimum of three percent in terms of our end of campaign reports. Many times we will over deliver that. But bearing in mind the average engagement rate on Instagram is around one point seven percent. Um, what one of the reasons I love influencer marketing is, is it really gives consumers an opportunity to see their products coming to life, really um, in the environment where their target audience are seen. Um, and obviously, if there's ways in which you can create an offer linked to it or some really important call to action, that's important. So you can just see straight away here. Um, that this campaign delivered an above average 3.4% with, with a staggering 800,000 people that were reached and a huge amount of comments. Now, 640 comments is great because now a lot of those might well be, you know, love it, great, awesome, but there might also be some, some really interesting insights that, that a brand would find really, really helpful and useful. And that's why when it comes to influencer marketing, don't ever underestimate the power of research and getting real you know, consumer insight. Um, here's another one which I particularly love. So the brand Dyson um, wanted to show the effectiveness of of um, what it what it does uh, really cleverly. Now it may surprise you to know that uh, dog and cat videos and posts are the highest viewed on the internet. And ironically, by working with um, uh, dogs and cat influencers. Um, they are the most expensive, actually, <laughs> proportionately, because there's obviously less of them. But uh, this Dyson decided to use uh, a number of dog owners um, and uh, really using real creative uh, imagery um, with regard to those. And look, look how many views they got from their videos, over 1 million with 115,000 likes and a staggering 10% engagement rate. Um, you know, here's another one here with um, uh, beauty brand. 
um, and they used uh, a, an influencer platform called Trend um, to, to locate real product users. And I think one of the things that people love more than anything else is is the reality of consumers as well as you know, consumer fans. Once upon a time, you know, many years ago when uh, word of mouth marketing was in its heyday before the word influencer marketing really came to bear. Um, you know, it would always be about celebrities, you know, celebrity endorsements. And now this funnel has moved all the way down from macro to, to, to micro and what we call nano influencers and even consumer fans. There's lots and lots of ambassador programs now that just include people that love the product. And that sort of user generated content can be really, really uh, powerful. And, and what um, um, and, and so lots of brands will often use gifting campaigns, but what they want to try and do is use influence as part of that excitement, bringing that brand to life. So there's a lot to be said for the packaging experience. Um, and this particular example was where they used um, unboxing videos to, to add excitement for the whole buyer experience. And yeah, look, we got, they did 50 videos, 675,000 uh, impressions, and a, and, a, and a huge amount of images created. And don't forget as well, guys, that these images that you use for these campaigns can be repurposed and used again. Um, Wonder Fruit is a festival um, in, uh, in Malaysia, actually. Um, in fact, uh, Jimbo will probably know quite a lot about that. And here's an example where, you know, what they wanted to do was use millennials and, and Gen Zs to really add some excitement to the experience. Um, so what, what they did is they used, uh, they set up um, um, some experiences before and they used, by the way, KOL is key opinion leaders. It's just a different term, terminology in Asia to, to influencers. And they used these individuals to give away tickets um, as part of uh, coverage uh, and endorsement. So it may well be that I don't think in this case the influencers were paid, but they were given um, you know, lots of things that add value to their audience. And I've often talked about this as well. Uh, and yep, look what happened. Um, 548,000 impressions, 1.3 thousand engagement, um, and uh, seven and a half thousand, um, seven and a half thousand uh, views as well. So really engaging. Here's another one, um, the Grand Hyatt. Uh, Sanya was looking to build awareness for a family summer camp. And what they wanted to use there was uh, a mummy influencer. Um, staying in some of their hotels. This is very popular within the hotel and travel industry, giving people a real experience. Um, and um, yeah, so they were really just, you know, re recreating as much as they possibly could, whether it be you know, going out to the restaurants, you know, feeling as though that could be me. So if you're thinking about creating an experience uh, online, how can you, before somebody's even bought the product, how can you recreate that in a way? Um, and look, you can see the results on the right hand side, uh, 1.1 million on WeChat, uh, over 2000 repost comments and likes and uh, 61,000 views, you know, massive return on investment. Um, I love this one in particular. So this was a video that uh, you can have a look at. I'll put the, the, the link in the chat afterwards, actually. Um, but, um, you know, I've been talking often about sort of behind the scenes videos can be one of the most powerful things that gets greatest traction. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen in, on TV, but um, how it's made, it's one of the satellite channels. But I can just watch those, those TV channels for like hours because it really is fascinating as, as to see how products come to life. So what they did in this particular instance is to... Um, uh, is to show how what what goes in behind a, a typical Nike sh um, shoe, um, but look, it's been this particular view, this particular video has been viewed over three point six million times, and it's had way over thirty thousand likes. So again, it's another really good idea. Um, I'm not going to go through any more. Um, I'm just going to hand over, if I may, to. Um, to Jimbo uh, Gurmit, who's going to share some of the other ones that we've done in uh, audience to media. Yep. Thank you, Gordon. Just give me a second.
And when when uh, when we've finished um, uh, in about ten minutes or so, and um, then uh, you know any questions that you've got, let's let's try and answer them specifically. So think about some questions and things that have popped up. Yep. Okay, so just to give you an overview, um, what we've done is we have compiled or collated our case studies, past successful campaigns into this interactive flipbook that is hosted on the website. So it's very much data light in terms of an attachment. It's so much more easier when you send it to prospects or clients versus you know the usual way of sending a company profile in PDF or in PowerPoint. So unless clients specifically request for that, we normally send this first as part of our lead generation exercise. It gives the client an overview about who we are, what we do, what's our USB services and such, right? And then most importantly is definitely the case studies. So everyone has an overview of the different brands that we've worked with in the different um, sectors, right? So I'm gonna show you, let's see, 24. Yep, <clears throat> right. So the first one, all right, I think it's clear enough, everyone can see, is for Vodafone UK. And this one was for their broadband packages, right? And the whole idea was, Vodafone said, all right, listen, uh, audience media, we need to find the right influencers that can relate to those specific broadband packages. So for example, as part of the solution, um, we even worked with uh, influencers who are parents with kids. So they created a specific piece of content that was more relatable to a bigger household, right? And they needed a more uh, higher end package. So more bandwidth in that retrospect, you know, whether it's 500 Mbps or one gig because the requirements were much more bigger. And <clears throat> 30 content pieces were created on Instagram. And out of the total campaign, we got nine, nearly 1 million impressions, 3.7K clicks to the Vodafone Broadband website. And we've put it, the design of the case study, as you can see, is very clean. It's not too cluttered because end of the day, when it comes to the case study, you do what works best for yourself and your organization in terms of how you represent your brand. But the golden tip is never clutter your case study too much. There's so many free layouts out there, templates as well, but take your time, see how different people do it, right? And see what works for you. It's, it's a hit and miss in a trial and error. You do the first one, and this is not even our first version, to be honest, guys. We've done like, you know, 4.0, 5.0. God knows this is probably 11.0 by now. And, you know, Annette, who's our marketing manager, who's just joined us, she's working on the latest version of it after this. So yeah, um, keep pushing to, you know, um, edit the content and the layout that suits you. Uh, Bo, so Bo is a Malaysia's biggest uh, tea plantation. It was founded in 1929 by J.R.R. Russell, a uh, British um, businessman who came to Malaysia and found the Highlands, uh, which was a hill station, really cold weather, suitable for uh, tea plantation. Right. So with Bo, they came to us specifically, not so much for your standard tea bags, because everyone drinks tea, but this is specifically for green tea and jasmine green tea, very niche products that not every is not everyone's cup of tea. Right. Not everyone drinks green tea, but those who find the um, health benefits attached to it. And the challenge was they wanted to um, target the younger audience, millennials more specifically. And it's going to be tough. I mean, which millennials sit and drink tea? But the whole idea was to destigmatize de tea and talk about how jasmine tea helps you de-stress, um, helps you with your you know, mental well-being. And we work with a group of 25 plus year old lifestyle influencers, as well as fitness influencers. So it was relevant to them and relevant to the audience that follows. And this was a very big campaign because we created 95 pieces of content um, on Instagram as well as display ads as well. And, and basically, you know, we've got really good reach. As you can see here, we've, we, we put four main metrics, right? The number of content pieces, engagement level, impression, and reach. So when it comes to what case studies you may want to do, do it based on what's, um, you know, what is the KPI or ROI that you want to feature that sells you and you know your service and product in that retrospect. 
Uh, another one is Voxy. So Voxy is a mobile virtual network operator in the UK that's powered by Vodafone technology. And the whole idea is, um, you know, their mantra, endless social media, right? Because you get like, for example, 12 quid, uh, SIM only buys you 12 gig of data plus endless social media. So meaning anytime you are streaming YouTube, you are on social, uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever, it does not eat into your general data. That general, that 12 feet data is just for, you know, when you're browsing the net and whatever not. So very, very niche uh, Gen Z audience that we were looking at. And so we got a group of Gen Z millennial influencers that worked to talk about how endless social media came into play um, and they didn't have to worry about, you know, a data cap in that retrospect. And what we did was the best performing um, content piece, right? The Instagram post was converted into a display ad. Uh, that's something that we do in audience media. We call it BIA or behavioral influencer amplification. And it, in essence, it's like your standard display ad that says, you know, buy now, but you know, not everyone's going to click it, right? So in order to increase the uh, click-through rate, what we do is we convert the influencer content. So if you see your favorite influencer on, you know, the Guardian and it pops up at the top of the display ad, there's a higher chance to go, oh, that's interesting. And I might click it. And when I click it, it takes me back to the influencer's social page, which is promoting said product. And that's something that we find works really, that augurs really, really well. Um, do you want me to present another one, Gordon, or? Got in your mute. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Carry on. Um, carry on. Two, two or three more. Be great. All right. Sure. Right. <clears throat> JD Spots. Um, so this one, um, I mean, JD, as we know, is famous worldwide, especially in Europe and also in Asia. Um, what we did was um, JD Spots Malaysia had a 11 11 sale and uh, as many of you may know you know these special numerical dates are becoming a big thing especially on online shopping whether it's 3355 11 11 and whatever not so 11 11 is a big big deal in not just malaysia but um asean uh southeast asia as a whole and they wanted to promote uh specific products um and brands such as converse and nike and adidas and the whole idea was to use influencers to encourage um, the target audience or their followers to go to the brand store and shop before items are sold out. Because the problem with JD Spots is they don't stock up their, in, I mean, in terms of their inventory, they don't stock up many of each product. You know, once it's done, it's done, especially the, the, the special launches, your Yeezys and all that. So what we did was, um, again, because it was specific to a sales period, we just picked influencers who have the highest engagement rate and nothing more because the whole idea was bang we need results we need to drive traffic to the website to the e-com site and try and get more people to shop on jd and yeah um you know we got uh, within a very short period because it was basically a one day event when we did the pre-sale content just two days 48 hours before and that was it for you know a two-day um campaign we managed to garner nearly 500,000 impressions uh, a reach of almost 500,000, you know, within the population of Malaysia, which is about 33 million. But this was very, this was geo-fenced. We geo-targeted it only to the uh, various city centers that have a JD Sports outlet. So it wasn't like blanket spray and pray nationwide. We, we made sure we targeted it. Otherwise, if you, if you do it like, you know, a, a blanket overall country, you're wasting your money in terms of um you still get those impressions but those impressions don't convert into anything because somebody from the outskirts will go oh okay i've seen the ad but i can't buy this product so yeah and okay th this is the last one i'll show you it is batisse uh, batisse is a unique product here in malaysia because it is dry shampoo and you know dry shampoo is not something that everyone uses per se everyone still you know prefers their go to wet shampoo conditioner toner regime and so they they, they but batiste was like all right listen we need to change um you know the whole idea behind it because the 
The advantage of a dry shampoo is it's quick and easy. You can use it anytime and your hair is really clean. So it helps you cut down time on when you want to get ready for you know dinner and event, uh, whatever not. And what we did with this was because it was a brand new product to say, we had to add a sort of gifting element to it or a contest element to it, uh, whereby people who tag the influencers content, uh, tag your friends, they basically want a unique price and free uh, Batiste dry shampoos as well. So it, that that all got really well because there was that contest element tied to the influencers content. And that, that helped us. Um, and this was a very tight budget campaign, but it really did well. And plus point, this campaign ran during the pandemic. So during the lockdowns and it, was, it turned out to be a success. Yeah. That's brilliant. Well done. Thank you. Um, and guys, look, 10.6% engagement, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, it really, really is um, amazing yep. result. Okay, great. Uh, if you wanted to stop sharing or... There you go. Good. So um, what do we think? Any questions relating to what I or um, Jimbo has said? Harry. You know, I... Sorry, go on, John. Oh, John. Oh, no, Harry, after you. After you. After you. After you. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'd just like to start saying it's quite impressive how you guys got the uh, Voxy account. Uh, I've been to many uh, marketing awards and the Voxy, various Voxy campaigns have always been um, high up on the shortlist. So that I think that's a really good, really, Thank really you. impressive account. Um, my question is, um, so we talk about influencer marketing and um, how we talk about um, doing a social post for your company. How do we get that social or that influencer into more of a, uh, an ambassador for the brand? Is it purely a, um, a money driven thing? So put them on a retainer and they will, they will share your, uh, your message or is it more of like an educational thing for the influencer where you teach them about your brand, about the good values that you have for them to then get on board with with your brands how, how, how does that how does that work sure uh gordon do you want to do this or you want me to take it so you, well you start and then i'll i'll add right, some, sure, some my sure. thoughts on top well, well harry there's a few ways to look at it in terms and it all boils down to well first of all what brand it is that wants to use said influencer for um you know uh, as a brand ambassador so give an example if it's a non-profit organization uh very much there's hardly um, monetization involved because it's out of goodwill that it's more re relevancy of the influencer how the influencer he or she feels towards that cause that social cause so they'll probably go all right no worries um you know i'll tie up out of goodwill with you and most and most um what i get in return is maybe when you have events you know you would pay for the event as in under 10 and you know you probably get me a room or a dinner or something but that's about it um, there's hardly any monetization involved with nonprofits, um, but when it comes to you know a commercial brand, a fast move FMCG or whatever not, um, there's a few ways to go about it. Depends on what level of what le what type of influence you're looking at. If you're looking at your celebrity uh, level influencer, Ronaldo for example, Cristiano Ronaldo is not going to be anything. He's just money. He's like you, you know, I'm going to be your ambassador. Sure, why not? Whether it's for Rexona or anything else, um, but it's just purely um, commercial driven. Um, some of your micro influencers who may tie long term with the brand and that allows them, you know, to pull, create content for the brand, it might be a one plus one. So it, there might be a small retainer plus gifting because I'm really getting the products that I have to do, you know, the reviews for. So I, you know, if say, for example, it's Samsung, um, normally Samsung pays, but they would always put a, you know, a package of X value of pounds worth of phones, electronics, accessories that I'm going to give you anyways, because you have to talk about me. Um, so then those influencers will go, okay, I don't mind. I'm going to get a pair of new earbuds, you know, a new Galaxy phone. Why not? So there's, there's a few ways, few models to approach in that retrospect. Gordon? Yeah, um, I mean, the other thing I was going to say in terms of building long term partnerships, and by far, you're going to get greater engagement when you're working with a brand ambassador. Um, I love the word ambassador, because in a way, it's, it's, people love being recognised, because it gives them that authority amongst their audience. Um, 
there's lots of brand ambassador programs that are involving just consumers that love, in your case, food, frozen food or whatever. Um, so um, I sometimes think a mixture of influencers and user generated content can work really, really well. It's almost like the professional influencer leads the charge and actually encourages um, the, the everyday consumers almost like somewhat aspirational. Um, you can also, um, I mean, I'd like to get Sandy's view on this as well as a network marketer. One of the things that works really, really well is this is the hierarchy of, of rewarding people for, for effort. So for example, because, you know, being an ambassador, it's all very well having a badge, but you've got to be almost have your own community manager, you've got to be constantly going, keeping it fresh, keeping it different. Because that's what what will happen, Harry, is you get this massive surge at the beginning. And then actually, you know, every, people's attentions are diverted away from other things. So, you know, what you could do is this month's promotion is, this month's campaign idea is, um, and then almost have your own leaderboard and say, you know, a, a big shout out to, to Gemma, who's done this, this and this. Um, and she gets a silver badge. And um, we're, we're about to be working with a massive global brand at the moment and something that they've done just recently has had phenomenal impact. And that is basically about rewarding the, the, the top booksellers. Um, and what they've done is they've almost created a little trophy. And the, the, um, what's happened is the influencers have been so chuffed about receiving this, this sort of silver award or gold award for their most amount of recipe books sold that they've shared that with their audience. And guess what? Their audience are loving it. They're saying, you know, well done. I'm I need to go and get this book. So it's actually not only rewarding the people that have already bought the book, but, you know, if you're connected with an influencer and you love what they do, you're almost a semi-fan. You know, and if they are being rewarded and recognized by their industry that they're in, they want that success as well. So I think um, having a program, an ambassador program, and it's something I do cover as a whole chapter in my book, actually. Um, but but if anybody's interested, we have covered this before on a whole roundtable event. Um, so there'll be a video about this uh, as well, Harry. Um, but I really believe particularly in the sector that you're in food is massive it's one of the big areas and obviously your your angle of course is in frozen here so i think there's a lot to be said for that um just want to bring in sandy i know you've got a little bit of a, 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 a sore throat but you know you're very much in the sort of recognition and hierarchy and, and and how does how do you there is some similarities isn't there with with what we're saying yeah i mean definitely it, 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 you know we celebrate everything um but, but also, you know, as a wider team, we celebrate everything. So if you look, I mean, I try and put 10 to 15 stories on a day, but quite a lot of them are welcome to the team posts and congratulations on your achievement posts. Yeah. And they're not necessarily my direct team, but they're wider team. And therefore we, we celebrate them all. And again, with events, you know, um, you know, we have, we have travel incentives and things. And if, you know, if there are people that don't qualify or they don't, you know, can't get to the event we still use all the pictures and all the social media to you know kind of tie us in with the the team I mean our overall our overarching team are called Unity Global and um, that they're run by a couple called Danian Fire and Stefania Lugato who are in the top 10 highest paid network marketers in the world and they have over a million people in their team Wow. Um, their team calls are um, translated into, you know, 12 different languages. They have their own team convention in Dubai. Um, you know, so, you know, we celebrate, you know, the, the whole team rather than just our team. And, and obviously, you know, we've, we've had people join the team from other companies that have, you know, seen what's on social media and have been following and watching and watching and watching. And, um, you know, when they go and Google um, Danian and Stefania or Unity Global, they can see what they're doing and they, they want to be a part of that. So, um, yeah, definitely. No, thank you, Sandy. Really useful. I mean, people react to things because of pain and gain, don't they? It's, it's often about yeah. what are they going to get from it or what are they what what pain are you solving or what are they going to lose out? People don't like the idea of mm -hmm. of something exciting is happening over there and they're missing out. So um, um, what we need yeah, to remember. FOMO is real. 
definitely FOMO is real. People, FOMO is real. People want Ab- to be a part of it. A- absolutely. And if you correct that, you know, why do nightclubs insist on having a queue outside the club always? You know, even if it's half empty, they'll still have the queue outside. <laughs> Um, but anyway, no, really good point, uh, Harry, and thank you for those that contributed. Um, Adam, I mean, I know this is sort of new to you, and you're in the sort of wellness space, aren't you? So, um, and I know you're at pre-investment and thing, but you know, I, again, I think what you're doing is really exciting. I mean, wellness, well-being, fitness is one of the other massive influencer buckets, um, and particularly over the last um, pandemic. Um, you know, some of these uh, people didn't decide to go back to the gym because they found YouTube creators. I mean, I follow Lucy Wyndham Reed, which I found on um, just by searching. She does a seven minute workout video. And here we are a year and a half later. And I still use I literally do my seven minute workout every single day. But what she does really, really cleverly, she's I, I can relate to her really, really well. She's very She's very nice, always smiling, but she's and, and she gives us tips. But what she's subtly doing is branding her little workout books, <laughs> uh, little things. This is the difference that that the people that have come of all different shapes and sizes, all different ages. So it's not like she's relating it only to the 23 to 25 year old market. You know, there's, there's, there's older age people there. She's got her Lucy Facebook squad and she's subtly putting these things in. And it just seems as though I want to connect with her, you know? So relatability is really important. Gordon, I've got a question for you then. Um, To what extent do you think testimonials uh, for brands and services have now been replaced by influencers? Or is influencers the point of getting the horse to the market and testimonials come afterwards? Do you you think uh, testimonials still have a part to play? Yeah, I think they do. I think, but the the great thing about... um, Um, when you think about comments so if an influencer posts something and individuals are commenting on that you that that takes it away from a a, a website testimonial all day long doesn't it because Mm -hmm. it's real you can see it in real life you can't uh, well I guess you could remove those but you can't force people to say things and the same thing that TripAdvisor trust advice you know these other these other online reviews have become so popular I mean, how many of us yeah. now go and look for a restaurant uh, or go and look for a destination when we're on holiday oh, just just double check yeah. and you know if you if you, you you are put off by something that's got lots of really really poor reviews hmm. um when actually if we went onto the website of those companies they can have all sorts of testimonials about how good they are and everything else but that's because they have the marketing team have have promoted that and there's a mm. where there's nothing like independent verification and um you know at the end of the day let's not forget influencers have a um have a vested interest in making sure a campaign works and delivers because if it falls flat mm. it falls flat for the brand but it also falls flat for the um for the testimonial as well for the sorry for the um for the I- I- influencer so a, a lot of the time when they're looking at taking on a brand and what um, Jimbo was saying a few minutes ago is um, they may all, they may not always seek payment, particularly if it's for a charity. Lots of charities, for example, um, don't pay influencers, but they, but they think about this from a wider picture. It would be good for, for it would be good for us to support a Ukrainian um, refugee charity because they they're not stupid they know that the amount of eyeballs on that content could be really highly relevant at, yeah. at this time um and and for their audience they would see them as though wow um she or he is really supporting something that's close to my close to their heart um and um you know i'm just using that as a relevant example right now you know you may think that um you want to connect with a with a children's charity i mean we ran when I was in my former trade association, we run National Promotional Products Week. And every year we ran it, we linked in with a major charity. And um, and I actually, on one evening, on one evening when I was hosting the event, um, I wanted to try and raise £10,000. And we had a charity auction uh, there. And because we set the limit in the evening, I mean, the, the, the whole room was behind it. They wanted to do their bit. They want, and as it rose during the evening, um, it was it was absolutely phenomenal. So there was this 
I don't know, this single connection of purpose that brought everybody together. And not only did they want to promote, because they wanted to promote the, 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 the week, but also the knowing that we were, um, we were supporting Alzheimer's and we hit it, we achieved it. Just giving, I think we got to 12,000 by the end of it. So um, it was really good. And actually, you know what? Everybody in the room felt really good about it. Even with the people that didn't actually contribute, but they just felt good. So this is why influencer marketing can be a really, really great thing to do is creating a buzz that people feel they connected with. I don't know if I've told you guys about a, 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 an agency that uh, that flew a number of influencers over to um, Brazil and they created a new product from scratch. Really, really amazing. Um, it was called Puricane actually, which is a sugar sweetener. And what they did is they, um, they involve these influencers, put them up for three nights in a hotel and almost create a strategy workshop for them. Um, everything from the design, creative, the purpose, the value proposition, all of those really, really amazing things. And not, not just looking at the influencers that were in the room, but actually they encouraged the influencers to reach out to their audiences during those three days and get their instant feedback. And so what we had was not only a, a, a new product that was created for the South American market, uh, which was different, by the way, from the um, North American market. Um, that, um, that, yeah, I mean, how amazing was it to get that that feedback from, from not just the people there, but of course their followers. When the product actually came to be launched, can you imagine the likelihood of people taking up on it or showing an interest? because they've been involved. People love to feel they're involved in something and engaged with something. Um, you may have seen, I'm sure I've seen stuff like Nike, and I don't know if you've seen this, Jimbo, where they've, they've almost put products in the early stage of research and have done some really good videos, which, which, are you, which, do you, which is important to you. Um, and they've used their, their influencers to reach out to, to their followers and say, we're looking at creating the next best shoe. Which of these things are important for you? Style, comfort? color um you know yep. and, and, and then getting all of this insight back but what they're cleverly doing they're involving consumers their target audience uh in the emergence of an exciting new brand so when this actually comes out can you imagine the amount of buzz and excitement yep yep i've i've heard of it um the other brand that you know really does it uh, really well is lego so oh, lego, lego has well. yeah so with lego as well they've got a fan database um, of you know influencers as well as loyal customers and you know they would do like a prototype design and then share it internally with this group of you know um you know it's it's, it's a bit like a focus group per se but if everyone provides feedback only then the product gets launched otherwise it does not get launched so yeah, yeah it, it's, it's an, it, you know it's it's called co-creation co co or co-creating so which is a good thing yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I want to add to that is on Lego. Lego have an online community that is in excess of four million people, and that is a. Um, and, and do you know what? Who makes up that? Bearing in mind, once upon a time, you think of you think of Lego as a um, um, as something you did and, and play with when you were a child. The majority of people in the Lego community are men, adults. You know, engineers. Um, there's even now challenges on TV. I don't know if any of you have seen some of the satellites, satellite which which Lego have created with branded content. I mean, I absolutely love it. It's really, really cool. Um, and of course, Lego have, have had films. You know, this is about really creating grant brand extension. And this is where you want to get those fans, those consumer advocates linked with influencers as well because the, the, the combination of really great creative with natural born fans is, is great for engagement. Any more questions? Yeah, um, Gurmit, when you were showing your uh, slides there, the, um, the pages, you, yep. you were showing how many uh, content had been used uh, was it reach and um, uh, what was the other what was the other areas? Sorry. Um, reach, engagement, impression. Engagement. I mean, impressions, That's video right. views, depends here. Yeah. So, for example, um, you, you mentioned I forget which one uh, in, in general. Let's say you you made thirty. There was thirty five pieces of um, 
content. content. Yep. That was th that was thirty five content pieces that were made by you guys. Yeah. By the influencers. Yep. Influencers. Okay. Influencers. And and how were they actually distributed? Was there a specific channel that they distributed through? Yeah, uh, that for that particular campaign, it was Instagram. Right. Okay. All right. Um, and then when you so if there's 35 different uh, content going out, and then you had a reach, is that an overall reach, or was that like the highest reach of one of them, or something? Uh, no, it's the overall reach. So right. the the general um, metrics is overall reach, overall impressions. Then what we also did was we put you know the top performing influencers. They yeah. had a specific um, number out there, like what what was their reach and what were their you know uh, engagement levels like. So then people could yeah. go, okay, these are the ones that contributed the most to the overall campaign. Understood, understood. Yeah. Okay, interesting, interesting stuff. The, I, I saw the T. Um, the T seemed to stand out the most with regards to the highest. If I was right, if I'm right in saying, it seemed to be the highest engagement and uh, whatnot with regards to the amount of content that was out there. Some yep. of them seemed high content, but the yield wasn't as high by any means compared to that T. It was uh, very interesting. Yeah, that, that's, that, that also boils down, John, to the budget and you know yeah. what we can get out of the budget. So with Bo, um, the budget was quite big. It was probably um, 30,000 quid. Um, right. and, and ring it and ring it it's a lot it's a lot honestly speaking yeah, very, so yeah, yeah, we managed yeah. to get you know really good influencers as well and they could mm -hmm. create not just static content but also video content because the other thing that's driven by price is what type of content the influencer is supposed to create so a lot right. of them negotiate in terms of right if you're just doing a static image um you know it could be a selfie with a product or whatever not in a caption mm -hmm. so that will appear on their instagram main feed and maybe one story so that'll be your basic rate and then yeah. you know which which hovers around 600 quid for a micro influencer mm -hmm. generally yeah. speaking yeah. Yeah. um but then you know if you need to include video content to appear on you know tiktok on um instagram reels so that's going to be you know a different cost to it as well so the budget uh, shifts based on how interactive and dynamic the content is and then that will allow us to determine whether we can put more influences or less uh, right. it works this and we normally find the midway um, for some clients they may go oh no you know i want 100 influences for that money we'll be like okay you can do that but you just you know we're, we're, we're scraping the bucket because that'll be the cheapest nano influences yeah. and is it going to churn results versus what if I can give you 50 quality influencers who are from that particular niche? They have the right followers who are the target audience you are seeking. I'd rather we spend the money there and you know have better tracking purposes in terms of the call to action. You know, maybe it could yeah. be a, a link. It's so much more easy to track and go how well the campaign is performing. Yeah. The, the other thing as well, um, guys, is sometimes by finding even within your niche, you can have influencers that have got a, a different style of the way they present your brand, different style of the, the content. For example, you may well have seen some of the fashion influencers that use these transitions really good. You know, so they look a bit of a mess. They then put the thing, out, they, they hand over the camera and all of a sudden they look very glamorous. Now, that's like been done to death now. But what is happening is a lots of lots of really great editing tools. You know, you're, you're actually starting to get some almost filmmaking qualities coming into the whole influencer space, which I find really, really exciting. Um, I also think that sometimes you get some of these influencers and the, the really smart ones have got their own style. I mean, I, I follow one who does lots of slow motion videos and she's often walking across the road. That's her style. So I get used to seeing her doing that, which is great because she's not only branding herself as an influencer, but she's branding her content in a way that actually um, makes it uh, relevant um, to the audience. Um, I had an interview with Shivas Regal a um, little while ago on my podcast, and they did some use some influencers in um, Asia. 
and uh, they found that some of the content was really resonating with a brand new audience for their brand in a way that they had never even thought about. So one thing that could be good is, is that you have a handful of influencers. Yes, they've got your brand message and what you want to get over to them, but they're going to create the content that they know is going to resonate with their audience. And it could be you're not going to get six or 10 or 50 like for like videos. You're going to get something a little bit different, a little bit quirky. And from that, you're going to see not all of them performing at the same level, which is what Gurmit was saying a few minutes ago. Sometimes when we run a campaign, we'll find out if we're using 50 um, half a dozen, h half a dozen of them are really going for it. Well, why is that? What is it that they're doing? So the insights and the optimization that can come from that can be really, really helpful. So when Harry was talking about, you know, an ambassador program, it's it's a bit like a work in progress and you start to develop things and you start to realize, well, that's working well. Let's change it. Let's move on. Oh, really great. We, I mean, yes, some of the involvement of that can be part of the the initial brainstorming session. And I I, I like to have like, um, you know, an opportunity to, to meet um, the, the, the video creators or influencers beforehand because you know these are little mini creative agencies so don't just use them as amplifiers involve them in the process right at the outset look this is what we're trying to do what do you think could work well I've often seen influencers you know do better jobs than multi-million tv campaigns that the brand has spent a lot of money on um, it's the simplicity um, and the relevance and the creativity that they've got shouldn't be underestimated <coughs> excuse me any other thoughts before we um say cheerio just uh, just to build a kind of what john was saying um is there a way uh is influencer marketing very much the brand awareness piece or is there a way to truly measure the roi of uh, an investment for influence marketing Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, you know, in the early days of brand aware of influencer marketing 2016, when it was really in its heyday, it was all top of the funnel. But believe me now, it has trooped way down to the to the bottom of the funnel. Now, it's as much about performance marketing as much as possible. That said, you know, we're now in the attention economy, you know, we're, we're competing for lots and lots of other eyeballs. And if people think, oh, well, I'm just going to use an influencer and, um, um, I'm going to generate loads and loads of sales from one post. No, that is not going to happen. And anybody that thinks that is de delusional. <laughs> um, it's the same way that if you saw an ad on TV, would you go and run out and buy that product afterwards? So having thought behind a campaign that is linked into your other advertising messages makes much more sense um you know if you're doing one of the great things about audience to media is is that we have phenomenal success when we add influencer com uh, content to this bia system which is behavioral um uh, influencer advertising in other words amplifying that content onto different ad formats so you might well see an influencer um banner ad on the Guardian newspaper online, on the um, you know Financial Times, or on a relevant trade publication, you know Wellness Today or Frozen Monthly. So you know, um, do you know what I'm saying here? You 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 really it, it, it can make a, a big a big difference. But um, yeah, Gurmit, do you want to just add anything to that? Uh, no, I'm good. <laughs> 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 okay that's great super um all right guys well look um thanks ever so much uh, i think this has been a really good session today um as as always look we've got to tell our friends i mean i've got a flipping great big facebook group here or i've got to do something with my marketing because we have <laughs> this is great content and we have had sort of 20 or 25 people before haven't we so if we can get more people to come in because i'm i'm always here um Gourmet always uh, is, is well, when he can, is going to come along. Um, so we've got some some great people. I want to get some more guests along, but we've got to get the people joining the group because it really is, uh, really is good. Um, but thanks again. Hope you have a lovely day and um, see you next Wednesday. Thanks, thanks everyone. Nice Thank to meet you, you all. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.